Good evening. I'm Stephen Romo in tonight for Gotti Schwartz. It is a primary night in a handful of states, including right here in New York. It's more of a formality at this point, in a way, as President Joe Biden and Donald Trump are both expected to easily win primaries since both men are already the presumptive nominees of their respective parties. But that did not stop Trump from hitting the campaign trail somewhat forcefully today, holding rallies in Michigan and Wisconsin. One major focus, the border. Every state is now a border state. Every town is now a border town because Joe Biden has brought the carnage and chaos and killing from all over the world and dumped it straight into our backyards. On day one, we will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration and begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history, starting with all of the criminals that are pouring in. Meanwhile, Trump's comments come less than a day after he posted a $175 million bond in his New York civil fraud case. That move preventing some of his most prized assets from being seized by authorities. NBC News correspondent Bon Hilliard was in Green Bay, Wisconsin earlier today. He has more. Stephen, we're just over seven months now from the general election, and this is Donald Trump's first stop in the state of Wisconsin on this 2024 election cycle here. There is another battleground state, Arizona, which he has yet to visit here, but for him in this general election, this is a time to ramp up. Uh, you've seen Joe Biden make multi-state stops over the last three weeks, and for Donald Trump, he's looking at the fact that he's got his first criminal trial slated to start on April 15th in New York City over the alleged scheme to hide those hush money payments made to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. And so for Donald Trump, he made a stop in Grand Rapids, Michigan today, where he focused in on immigration. And then here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, he is talking about immigration yet again. And for him, there's looking at a crowd of at least a thousand folks here. And for him, this is a, a, a key moment. Not only uh, did he just announce yesterday that he was able to post that $175 million bond, to satisfy the requirements stemming from the civil fraud suit against him and the Trump organization. But he is also, his legal team is currently fighting uh, other potential trials from taking place before the November election. So for Donald Trump, well, he's looking at being tied up in that New York courtroom, using today as an opportunity to get out on the campaign trail in the state of Wisconsin, a place that he lost by just about 10,000 votes back in 2020. And folks here in the crowd, despite blizzard conditions outside, uh, came out to see him, and this is going to be largely a base turnout election, and while independents will definitely make a difference in this race, we continue to see the energy and support for Joe Biden among his base of support, and for Donald Trump, his base of the MAGA movement support, uh, be potentially very defining, especially in places like here in Wisconsin. State. All right, Von Hilliard, thanks so much for that. And as for those primaries, Connecticut and Rhode Island are still too early to call right now. And in Delaware, the primaries were actually canceled because Biden and Trump were just declared the presumptive winners. All right, turning now to weather. Those April showers are coming in strong tonight for millions across the country, which is keeping folks on high alert as severe storms bring some dangerous conditions. Right now, tornado watches are in effect and across, across the Midwest. There have been at least four reported tornadoes over the last 24 hours in Oklahoma and Missouri, and severe storm damage was reported in Kentucky and West Virginia. Right now, more than 40 million people are under flood watches. Overnight, crews in Missouri rescued a man from his semi-truck after water started rushing in, leaving him stranded. Damaging winds up to 75 miles per hour and large hail are also possible. A student at the University of Kentucky was literally thrown to the ground by the wind there. In Indiana, severe wind and rain blew out all four windows of one woman's car as she was on her way to work. Gravel in my head, there's glass in my head, you know, whatever, and mud, there's still mud behind my ears. It's almost overstimulation of senses. It, everything's so loud and powerful, like nothing I've ever experienced before. Wow. NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman is joining me, and we'll have more coming up in just a moment. And we'll have the very important latest forecast. But first, let's go to NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky in Oklahoma with the latest there. 
Yeah, Stephen, we've had a chance to spend the better part of today here in Barnstool and of the entire state uh, that saw the impact of the storm. This community really the hardest hit. You can see just some of the damage behind me. And when you see what this storm was capable of, it is incredible uh, when you hear that not only was uh, have there been no injuries here in this town, but also across the entire state of Oklahoma. I spoke to one man. He was inside a building just minutes before the storm caused it to collapse. And he echoed similar sentiment to so many other people in this tight-knit town. And that is that forecasters went above and beyond and really channeling the path of not only the storm, but of those tornadic cells within it. And that gave people here in Barnstall precious minutes they needed to go ahead, get underground, take whatever shelter they could ahead of this reported tornado. In the meantime, we know that this system that spawned multiple tornadoes in Oklahoma continues to make its march to the northeast. The governor of Kentucky today issuing a state of emergency, uh, and that is after multiple tornadoes were reported, and we saw drenching rains combined with high winds uh, wreak havoc really all across that state. What's interesting is that with the rain that's falling in the south, as this system makes its way north, that's going to turn into snow. And believe it or not, parts of New England uh, could be facing blizzard warnings by the end of this week. Uh, all part of uh, these spring storms that we know come every single year. I mean, that certainly doesn't make it any easier for anyone to have to deal with them. Stephen. All right, Morgan Chesky, thanks so much. And NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins me now with more. Michelle, thanks for being here. Yeah. Wow, so many more people that are still facing these severe weather threats. Who's looking to get hit the hardest here? Yeah, we're looking at a lot of people, 50 plus million people wow. overnight looking at some storms. And that's going to continue into tomorrow. So let's show you what's happening right now because we still do have a very serious situation. We are tracking tornado watches. That is in the pink here. I took the radar off, but just so where you can see what is happening right now. See all these little red boxes? Those are tornado warnings. So we're looking at tornadoes, observed tornadoes, uh, whether it's confirmed, also radar indicated. We're going to be continuing to watch that. We now have nine reported tornadoes since yesterday. Most likely we're going to add five at least uh, from this afternoon. And then from tonight, we're going to add some more as well. So we're still dealing with a very dangerous, dangerous situation. We're looking at winds gusting up to 70 miles per hour with any of these storms, very large hail uh, and very heavy downpours. Radar showing us that we are looking at some strong storms. There's that cold front. Really easy to see where it is. We're clear back behind it, so this needs to move through, but it's not moving through very quickly. So we're looking at very heavy downpours. That's prompting some flooding, some flash flooding in some spots. I'll show you that in just a minute, but where you see those bright colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows, that's where we're seeing the heaviest downpours. We're also seeing lots of lightning with these storms, and we're seeing that rotation with some of these storms, and we're going to continue to have that threat as we go throughout the next couple of hours. Some of these tornado watches are in effect till 2 a.m. local time. Now, back behind the system, uh, we're, as ben, Vaughn mentioned earlier uh, in, in this newscast, we saw that we had blizzard conditions there. So the UP of Michigan has a blizzard warning, really cold air back behind the storm system. This is all going to move to the east. We're going to wrap in more colder air into portions of the interior northeast, also New England, where we could see blizzard conditions there, too, by Wednesday, Thursday into Friday. Let's talk about that severe risk for the rest of tonight, because still 53 million Americans need to heed any warning if you have a tornado warning you need to seek shelter you need to get to the lowest level of your house your basement lowest interior if you don't have a basement get to the lowest level or an interior room a bathtub uh, a door frame would be okay too you just need to seek shelter where you see this red here also the orange so columbus nashville chattanooga birmingham montgomery you're under the gun for some really strong storms that includes a yellow too so indianapolis down to uh, jackson this extends from the great lakes all the way to the gulf coast this is a lot of real estate and that's why we're looking at 53 million people for long tracking tornadoes could see violent tornadoes that was a verbiage from the national weather service really large hail we could see hail as large as tennis balls even softballs we saw that yesterday breaking windshields so once again that's really dangerous as well and the damaging winds. We have power outages in many spots. Again, the sun is setting and has set in some spots, and that makes it really dangerous. We have tornadoes moving through. Where you see this hatched area, we could see EF2 or greater. That is a very strong storm from Columbus, Charleston, Louisville, Nashville, Knoxville, and Birmingham. So this storm system is not over tonight, and it's not over tomorrow either. We're going to see this cold front moving to the east. So now we're talking about portions of the northeast into the mid-Atlantic, along the Carolinas as well. 22 million people at risk. 
us. Now, we're not going to see storms as strong as today, but still it's not a zero risk for tornadoes. We have the risk for hail. We have some winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour expected for Raleigh, Charleston, Jacksonville, also Tampa. And we're expecting a lot of rain. Heavy downpours over saturated grounds. These storm systems are going over the same area. 41 million people impacted from the Ohio Valley into the northeast, into portions of the interior parts of the northeast, even the mid-Atlantic. We're looking at the chance for two to four inches of rain, and we could see rain coming down one to two inches per hour, and the ground's already saturated, so we're going to be watching that tomorrow as well. Wow, spring is just all of a sudden here, it seems like. We better have a lot of Mayflowers, right? That's right. Yeah. We have earned those Mayflowers. <laughs> uh -huh. Michelle Grossman, thanks so sure. much. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started tonight. Up next, an Israeli airstrike kills seven World Central Kitchen workers in Gaza. We'll talk to a woman who also worked for the organization, which goes into disaster zones bringing food to those in need. Plus, the New York City inmates who are suing because they can't watch the solar eclipse next week. Can they even do that? You won't want to miss that one. And later this hour, school heroes keeping music alive in L.A. schools. NBC's Liz Kreutz has that inspiring story. So stay tuned. Welcome back. A rare apology from the Israeli government after strikes killed seven workers from Chef Andre's charity group, World Central Kitchen. That story in just a moment. But first, let's take a quick look around the world. A 12-year-old student in Finland is facing murder and attempted murder charges for shooting three students and killing one. That is according to police. The boy's name has not been released, but police have confirmed he is in custody. The shooting happened today about 10 miles from Helsinki. That, according to a 2018 survey, by the way, Finland has one of the highest gun ownership rates in Europe. Police in Istanbul have detained several nightclub workers, including the managers, after a fire there killed at least 29 people today. The place was undergoing renovations and was closed to the public, so a number of those killed were construction workers. And that detail is raising questions about whether the nightclub was following proper fire regulations because it didn't seem to have the permit needed to perform any renovations. An avalanche in Switzerland has killed at least three people, including a 15-year-old from the U.S. A fourth person survived and was flown to a nearby hospital with serious injuries. It happened near an area called Matterhorn Peak last month. Five people in that same area were found after disappearing while cross-country skiing. Well, Chef Jose Andres is suspending his life-saving food operations in Gaza. That's after an airstrike killed seven aid workers. They were working with his disaster relief charity, World Central Kitchen. Three of the organization's convoys were hit while traveling on a coastal road that was cleared to be an accessible road for aid, at least according to the UN. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu acknowledged the strikes, saying his forces, quote, unintentionally hit innocent people. Chef Andres Charity has provided more than 43 million meals to Palestinians since the start of the war. He's now calling this, quote, indiscriminate killing to end. NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez has more. Israel facing mounting questions today about how its forces killed those seven aid workers from World Central Kitchen, the victims from around the world, Australia, the UK, Poland, Gaza, and also at least one U.S.-Canadian dual citizen. Now, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is saying this was a tragic case of Israeli forces unintentionally killing non-combatants. Israel has promised to mount an investigation at the highest levels to find out what happened here. But World Central Kitchen, the charity founded by Chef Jose Andres, saying that the killings are unforgivable. And they are asking how this could have happened, given that the three cars in this convoy, at least two of them, were clearly marked with the logo of the World Central Kitchen. They were driving in what's called a deconflicted zone, a zone that's supposed to be safe for humanitarian organizations to operate in. And the charity is saying that they spoke to the Israeli military ahead of time about the movement of those vehicles. I asked an Israeli government spokesman, given that the organization did everything it possibly could have, apparently, 
to signal to the Israeli military that it was not a threat. How is it possible that these seven aid workers still killed by Israeli bombs? This spokesman saying to me that this was an unintentional strike. It was a mistake that happened in the chaos of war. Now, it may have been a mistake, but it was far from an isolated incident, according to the United Nations, which says more than 200 humanitarians have been killed in Gaza since the start of the war, the vast majority of them Palestinians. That is a toll that shatters previous records. World Central Kitchen, pausing its operations in Gaza in the aftermath of these killings, and we are already seeing the real-world impact of that. There were a number of ships heading from Gaza to Cyprus, carrying aid that was supposed to be heading towards northern Gaza, an area the UN says is on the brink of famine, an area where our crews have seen parents trying to keep their children fed with grass, with barley, meant for feeding animals. Those ships have now turned around with only a portion of the aid delivered. They are heading back to Cyprus, and the impact of that is going to be felt by a lot of very desperate people in Gaza today. Back to you. Raf Sanchez, thanks so much. Joining us now is Grace Ramirez, a World Central Kitchen ambassador and friend of one of the victims in this attack, Zomi Frankam. I, uh, you were telling me a bit about Zomi. Thank you so much for being here. I am so sorry for your loss. If you could start off just telling us what is your reaction to this and how are you doing? You know, Zomi was somebody that, you know, we worked with World Central Kitchen for many, many years. And Zomi was somebody that you would call upon being the first one. Um, and I feel we were very similar in that sense that you would call us and we would be the first ones to be there on the front lines of any kind of uh, war, a, you know, anything we were there. Mm -hmm. And we let uh, the COVID initiative here in New York City for a, a year and something. We were feeding frontline workers and the community in me, and she was something, somebody that I call my dear friend, but my colleague. Yeah, interestingly, one of our correspondents, Richard Engel, actually spoke to Zomi some time ago uh, about what World Central Kitchen was doing in Gaza. I do want to play a bit of that sound and, and then ask you more about Zomi right yeah. after this. The situation in Gaza is, as we all know, incredibly bad. Um, it's going to require all of us working together, um, making efforts as these any way possible to bring meals into Gaza. So if that's C-130, overland, by sea, whatever it is that we can do, World Central Kitchen will be there. You can hear her passion there. Tell us a bit more about Zomi. Why was it so important for her to be involved with World Central Kitchen? You know, I was just in Israel. I was just, and, and then, you know, right on the border of Gaza. And I feel like we're the same person. We are going to be the first ones to be called to be there for humanity, to be there for going to. And I, I just really, truly hope that her death does not go, you know, I just hope this raises awareness of what is really, truly happening there. And Zomi was somebody who was um, that you can call upon anywhere and anywhere, and she was just there, willing to help. And and humanity just lost a very good soldier. What do you think this means for Gaza that World Central Kitchen is now moving out and no longer able to provide meals due to this? I cannot speak about that, but it's it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy altogether of, of you know, World Central Kitchen was there providing, I, th I believe, two million meals a day. Mm. And now I think it's time to regroup and say, what is going to happen from now on? Um, Jose is a great leader, and I think he will have some answers for us. I just lost a friend and a colleague who was amazing at what she did. And I want to honor her today. Yeah, I would love to ask you a story about Zomi that, that makes you smile. <laughs> you know what she would do? When we were doing the World Central Kitchen Initiative, um, imagine it was the height of the pandemic, and she literally bought like 50 uh, measuring tapes, 
so we would not be six feet together. <laughs> and and we were at a, at a war room, mm. um, and she would not let anybody stand but six feet in front. And, and we now, all of us that led that initiative have that measuring tape, and we will re always remember Zomi for keeping us safe because she was so concerned about our safety. Mm. And now we all have that measuring tape. Oh. What a, a great memory and such a, a thorough job there. Grace Ramirez, thank you so much for coming in and sharing thank those you. memories. We thank certainly... you. I hope her death is not in vain. And um, thank you guys for highlighting her work and what she has done for humanity. Very well said. Grace, thanks so much. Well, a dream vacation turned into a nightmare when eight passengers on a cruise ship say their ship left them stranded on an island off the coast of Africa. The company says they came back to the ship too late. Here's NBC's Aaron McLaughlin with more. A mad dash for passengers to catch their cruise ship, triggering a seven-day ordeal. We've flown, it's actually seven countries we've been in in 48 hours. Jay and Jill Campbell and six other Norwegian cruise passengers were on a 21-day voyage up the coast of Africa. But last Wednesday, it all went wrong for the group after they left the ship for a private excursion to the African island country of Sao Tome and Principe, but didn't make it back by the 3 p.m. deadline. And the ship left without them, their passports handed to the local port agents. Even though the couple says the private tour operator notified the captain they were going to be late. And despite the Coast Guard's attempt to get them on the ship, which was still docked. We truly believe that, you know, although there's a set of rules uh, or policies that the ship may, may have followed, they follow those rules too rigidly. The passengers arranged to board again in Banjul, Gambia, traveling there on their own expense. But the cruise line says the ship couldn't dock due to weather. In a statement, Norwegian Cruise told NBC News, once the guests did not make it back to the ship, we worked with them and the local port agent to assist with obtaining the necessary visas for them to rejoin at the next available port, noting the group was an hour late when the ship initially left without them. Still, the Campbells telling the Today Show. I believe that they really forgot that they are people working in the hospitality industry. Tonight, the cruise line saying the unexpected adventure has been resolved. All eight guests reboarding the ship this morning in Senegal. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News. Aaron, thanks. And we have some results from those presidential primaries tonight in Rhode Island and Connecticut. Both former President Trump and President Biden have won their party's primaries. We'll bring you more results as they come in. Meanwhile, coming up next, the trouble with child care. A whole lot of daycare centers are closing their doors, and some families simply can't afford their services. Why experts say we are headed straight off a child care cliff. That's next. Welcome back. Here are some of the stories that we're following out west. The city of Denver says it's closing three of its four remaining migrant shelters this week. Officials say it's because there isn't much a need for them and it'll help cut costs. There are more than 700 migrants needing shelter there right now, down from almost 5,000 back in January. A big help has been nonprofits and community members moving migrants into housing. The trial of Chad Daybell, the husband of the doomsday cult mom, has wrapped up its second day. Jurors still need to be chosen for the trial that's expected to last eight to 10 weeks. Daybell is being charged with a triple murder case for the death of his first wife and the deaths of his second wife's two children. If he's convicted, he could face life in prison or the death penalty. And over to Oregon, where a new bill has been signed there that recriminalizes small amounts of hard drugs. The new measure reverses a 2020 initiative that aimed to deal with the state's worsening addiction and overdose crisis. Possession of small drugs like heroin or methamphetamine can now be counted as misdemeanors and punishable by up to six months in jail. Drug treatment will also be offered as an alternative to criminal penalties. And turning now to an incident out of San Bernardino County, California. According to a video just released by authorities, an unarmed 15-year-old girl was shot and killed by sheriff's deputies just as she appeared to be surrendering to them. 
Back in September of 2022, the California Highway Patrol issued an Amber Alert saying Savannah Graziano was kidnapped by her father. Well, about 24 hours later on Highway 15, authorities finally cornered the pair after a 70-mile car chase, during which her father repeatedly fired shots at officers. Well, once stopped, Savannah exited the passenger side of the car, and she started to walk to a nearby deputy who told her to walk toward him. That's when another deputy fatally shot her. Take a look for yourself, but we do want to warn you, this video is disturbing. So troubling to see and hear. Authorities also released a belt audio recording from the deputy, and you could hear what went on. Take a listen. So hard to listen to. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Elwin Lopez for more on this. Elwin, first, we just saw and listened to how this ended. But if you would walk us through what led up to that moment when she was shot, what else do we know? Yeah, Stephen, just before that shooting, a gas station clerk actually spotted the truck and recognized not only the truck, but the father, Anthony Raziano, and that teenage girl, Savannah, from an Amber Alert. Remember that just 24 hours before that, authorities say that Anthony Raziano shot and killed his estranged wife and the mother of that teenager and also shot at two other people near a school before taking off with that 15-year-old teen. That's when, after authorities were finally able to catch up to him after that 911 call by that gas station clerk. They surrounded him and that gunfire ensued. First of all, officials say that the suspect is the one who initiated that gunfire and the deputies responded firing back. We know from that scene that it was incredibly chaotic and that gunfire, Stephen, continued even after that truck came to a halt. That is so troubling on so many levels. I know this happened back in 2022. Do we know any more now? It sounds like she was doing what she was told and still ended up shot. How are they responding? How did this happen? Yeah, Stephen, so we have to remember that this was an incredibly chaotic scene. That gunfire was still ringing out when deputies responded and that truck came to a stop. You see Savannah, as soon as the truck stops, get out of the passenger side of the car, and she is crouching down to the floor while that deputy is saying, come to me, come to me, walk, 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 walk. And she is slowly but hesitantly walking towards that deputy because of the amount of gunfire that, that is happening at that time. And and so during that moment, other deputies, at least another deputy, fatally shoots her. And it seems that because of the chaos, there is somewhat of a miscommunication there. I talked to the use of deadly force expert, Ed Obayashi, and he says that during those moments of high stress and unpredictability, officers are responding as they can in those moments. And because of the stressful situation that they were going through, they just didn't know potentially whether they were coming after attack but based off of that suspect or whether she was shooting, they just didn't know what was happening at the time. The other possibility here is that she was caught in crossfire. That is something that they're still investigating as of right now, Stephen. And Owen, you mentioned that they're currently still investigating. Do we know at all, have the officers involved, were they ever put on leave? Do we have any of those details? Yeah, so we reached out to the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. They referred us to the state DOJ. We know that the attorney general here in California is investigating this. And as you know, some of these investigations can take years. It's already been two years, but this is something that they're actively investigating, Stephen. Yes, at just 15 years old. Troubling to hear that. Elwin Lopez, thank you so much. Thank you. Now, usually in U.S. public schools, religion and education are kind of meant to be separate, right? That's part of the whole separation of church and state thing. Well, somehow a group in Ohio has been allowed to bring Bible studies back during the school day, and it's causing quite a bit of a stir. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton has more. As classmates head to the library, this group of Whitehall School District students in Ohio put on matching shirts, board a bus, and head half a mile down the road to church. There, elementary students like Emmanuel and Savannah Brady pray Amen. and study scripture. He approached the Philistine. 
This is LifeWise Academy, a nonprofit bringing the Bible back into the public school day. Learning really helps you learn about Jesus and what happened in the past. How popular would you say it is at school? Mainly, like, the whole class is, like, over at LifeWise. LifeWise started in 2018 with two schools. Today, it partners with more than 300 schools in a dozen states. It's funded by private donations, and it's legal, so long as it's optional, off-campus, and not during essential classes like math. Though to some, it represents an increasingly blurry line between the separation of church and state. Doug Shoemaker, a Whitehall administrator, says the district has allowed this kind of program for decades. We neither discourage participation or reward or encourage it. Dad Daryl Brady says LifeWise lessons positively motivate Emmanuel and Savannah. Do you think church has a place in school? Yeah, I mean, we tr we're trying to bring churches back into schools for a long time. Some of these sessions take place when library periods would be happening in school. Mm -hmm. Are you worried about your kids missing out on that experience? Not at all. I mean, there's 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. Founder Joel Penton says he saw a growing need, including those unable to afford private Christian schools. In this area, about 50% of the students take part in LifeWise. What do you think that means for the other 50%? Do you think they feel left out? I wouldn't characterize it that way. Kids go in different directions all the time. On the playground, some kids play kickball, other kids will go to the monkey bars. This is a little different because these kids are going to physically be gone. Sure. I mean, hopefully LifeWise is an attractive thing that uh, people will want to participate in, but we certainly don't ever want to put any undue pressure. But Ohio mom Sarah Myers says that LifeWise does exert pressure. She's a Christian with a daughter in a school partnering with them. No, she won't ever let her take part, though. It is all above board until it's not. No school staff person does anything until they do. Chapters promised ice cream or popcorn parties if kids got their friends to sign up. Another Ohio mom sent NBC News this note her child received from a classmate on LifeWise letterhead, pre-written to say, my favorite part of class is the classmate writing everything and inviting the child to join LifeWise. LifeWise told NBC News that like many youth groups, they offer incentives for students and families to learn more and that they are no different from other organizations that advocate for the policies they believe in. What do you think LifeWise is trying to do? Influence, slant, if you will, public schools. Joel says he pays little attention to critics. In the United States, there are 13,000 public school districts. There are 50 million public school students. And he hopes to make biblical lessons available to every one of them. Antonia Hilton, NBC News, Columbus, Ohio. Well, if you have any friends or family with young kids, or you do yourself, you've probably heard about this next story. The rising costs of daycare centers. They lost billions of dollars during the pandemic, forcing some to close down and others to raise tuition. NBC News correspondent Rahim Ellis has more. Daycare is a place where kids can dream to be anything. A doctor, a post office worker, a dragon. But centers like this, Victoria's Castle Daycare in New York are in a tough spot. $24 billion in pandemic federal funding for child care, used for things like tuition assistance and teacher pay, ran out back in September. Now that the crisis is over, it just seemed like everybody forgot that we were here. Director Erica Perez says the center lost a quarter of its funding and had to raise tuition by about $200 a month. It's the center's first tuition hike in years. It puts a strain on some families. Carell Bain is a single mother and a post office worker, and for her, money is tight. Next month, her four-year-old will move from three days a week in daycare to five days, bumping her monthly tuition to more than $1,200. A thousand plus is almost damn near my whole check, and hopefully it can be brought down a little sum. The daycare tries to work with lower income families' budgets, but that can be tough because the center also needs to make money. That is always the concern. You know, how, how flexible can I be in for how long before the whole, you know, deck of cards comes crumbling down? Sometimes she's forced to make an agonizing decision. Either keep a family that can't pay or let the child go. 
you're almost, you know, saying goodbye to one of your family members. You become very attached to your families in, in your care. The loss of funding also means teachers here are getting hundreds less in bonuses. I wouldn't leave because we're going through a tough time. That's when you stick it out the yeah, most. Yeah, it's more than just money here. Over a few months, the center's enrollment more than doubled after other daycares in the area shut down. It's a familiar story nationwide. The Century Foundation, a think tank, estimates in each state, tens, even hundreds of thousands of kids could lose care. And a new survey of early childhood providers found more than half knew of a program closing in their community in the past few months. When we don't have reliable child care options, that means that, you know, many women are going to either lower their work hours or leave the workforce altogether. President Biden just signing a spending bill that'll give an extra billion dollars to child care programs. And some say the private sector has a role too. Media company The Skim launched a campaign calling on businesses to publicly share their child care policies. The responsibility to help working families, working parents and women stay in the workforce, stay as participants in this economy, doesn't just fall on one person or one part of the society. All of these businesses like Verizon, Paramount and MasterCard did share their plans, including things like work flexibility and care subsidies or stipends. It's a big problem begging a bigger solution to help ease the burden on parents looking to give their kids a brighter future. Welcome back. A wild story out of New York where inmates are suing to watch the solar eclipse next week. We'll get to that in just a minute. But first, here are some other headlines we're watching tonight. Take a look at this. The U.S. Navy has released the first images showing the underwater wreckage from Baltimore's key bridge collapse. This comes as the first ships have passed through a detour channel. While the port of Baltimore remains closed, it will be open only for essential ships like this one, which was used to supply jet fuel to the Department of Defense. And according to his campaign, independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has enough signatures to get on the North Carolina ballot. It's only the fifth state where he's crossed that mark. In 2020, Trump narrowly won North Carolina and is expected to be a battleground this November. Tonight, a man is in custody after reportedly driving into a barrier at the FBI's field office in Atlanta after he unsuccessfully tried to drive past the barricade. He got out of his car and tried to get past the gate. No weapons were found in his vehicle. In Texas, a highly infectious strain of bird flu has been detected in a human being. The diagnosis comes one week after the virus was found in dairy cattle in several states across the country. The infected person worked at a dairy farm where bird flu was present, but it's not clear whether he was infected by a cow or by that same source that infected the cows. All right, we're following some breaking news. A massive 7.5 earthquake has struck near Taiwan, and it is now raising concerns of tsunami threats to Japan. Now, Japan has already issued a tsunami alert to its southern islands and is warning people there not to leave designated safe zones. We are continuing to monitor that situation there, and we'll bring you updates just as soon as we get them. Meanwhile, we are less than one week away from the total solar eclipse. And for some, the phenomenon is not only a visual one, but a spiritual one. And that's the reason behind New York inmates suing the state corrections department over prison lockdowns during the eclipse. The suit argues that the lockdown violates the inmates' constitutional rights to practice their faiths, preventing them from taking part in a, quote, religiously significant event. NBC News legal analyst Angela Sinadella is here to break down this lawsuit, which has a lot of people talking, Angela. These men are of uh, six different, uh, they're six different men of different faiths. They're Muslim, Baptist, and atheist. So they're claiming religious grounds as reason that they need to leave. Do they have a case here calling this a religious uh, event and can they win? So, Stephen, this is what we would call a valiant effort, but not mm. necessarily a lawsuit that has a lot of merit. And it's interesting that you mentioned all the different faiths of these people, because I think that's such an interesting part of this lawsuit. And that might seem on face that it gives it gravitas, that people of different religions are feeling the same violation to their spirituality. But in actuality, that is what will weaken this lawsuit, because mm. the cases that do well with religious discrimination are when people of one religion are treated differently from 
those of another. But if you think about the prison system overall, if there is a lockdown and people across the board are having their freedoms abridged, well, in a lot of ways, that's the point of the prison system. You give up this right to do a lot of things when you enter that prison system. So the lawsuits that you do see taking wind and being successful are ones, for example, with headwear or with dietary accommodations when people of one religion are given accommodations but not of the other. So in this case, mm. because it's across the board, it's pretty weak, Stephen. Oh, interesting. One thing I thought was interesting about this lawsuit is one of the plaintiffs actually got special permission to go and view the eclipse, and that special permission was taken away. Do we know why that was? Okay, so that, in, in the context of a weak lawsuit, this is actually the strongest part. So oh. this man was an atheist, and he said it was important for him as an atheist to be able to view the solar eclipse. And in doing so, he did get this special permission. But then he went back after getting that permission and asked for permission for all of his friends of mm. different religions. And at that point, the Department of Correction said that they could not accommodate all of these, and probably actually to reduce liability on their end. That's why they took it away from him, because had they kept his special permission, but then did not allow people of other religions to also view it, that's when we would have these religious discrimination cases that I just talked about that could be successful. Fascinating. He tried to share and expand it, and that's what shut it down. Yes. Speaking of shutdowns, I'm curious, what is the thinking behind these shutdowns for prisons during an eclipse? It doesn't necessarily seem like a natural thing. Right. So the stated reason is for security and for safety, that due to all of these inmates wanting to view the eclipse and for their allegedly claiming to be totally Total darkness for a few minutes that that could possibly cause some safety and security issues and that also really weakens a lawsuit because prisons have wide berth, wide discretion to determine what is in the best security interests of the people and their staff and also of their inmates and that's actually also where the biggest liability lies like if all these inmates are outside and something does happen to a guard or someone then the prison is even more responsible so all these decisions are actually made in the lens of liability in, on behalf of these prisons. All right. doesn't sound like we're going to be at the edge of our seat to see what happens with this lawsuit. Likely not. NBC News legal analyst Angela Sinadella, thanks so much. If you don't follow Angela on TikTok, you should. She is great on there. Well, before we go, it is time for the future of everything. First, she became the youngest person to visit every single country. But I guess that was just not enough because that same young woman broke another world record, hitting the entire world in an electric vehicle. That incredible story. That is coming up next. Stay tuned. Welcome back in time now for the future of everything. Tonight, we are talking about the future of travel. Florida native Lexi Alford is no stranger to world records, holding the title of the youngest person to visit every country in the world. Now, she can add another record to that list. She's the first person to travel the world in an all-electric vehicle. NBC News correspondent Priya Sridhar has the story. From Australia to Zimbabwe, Vietnam to Argentina, Lexi Alford has seen it all and even broken a few world records along the way. For me, breaking world records is always about challenging myself and seeing what's possible. When she was just 21 years old, she stamped her passport into the history books, becoming the youngest person to visit every country. This was a dream of mine for so many years. I got to travel a lot with my family as a kid and fell in love with it. I started backpacking when I turned 18 and a crazy three and a half years later, I ended up breaking that world record and celebrating it in New York City. <laughs> Now at 25, Lexi has been running down a new dream, circumnavigating the globe in a Ford electric vehicle. When it comes to electric vehicle travel, there's so much speculation on what it's like around the world, if it's a viable solution or alternative to normal cars. And I wanted to see what was out there, and I definitely found out. Here's a look at Lexi's most recent globetrotting journey by the numbers. 200 days, 27 countries, six continents, and more than 18,000 miles. Follow me here to watch a new world record be set in real time. Lexi documenting her journey and its challenges on social media as Lexi Limitless. I want to show you how I charge my electric vehicle in the middle of nowhere. This From troubles finding places to charge in Zimbabwe. There was 
literally zero infrastructure for electric vehicles, which meant I had to get a bit more creative. I started doing domestic charging, which is basically using normal household outlets to charge my car. I have to drive in like five hours. To sickness in India that threatened to derail the whole trip. This can't be happening again. It's almost like a domino effect when something like that happens because I have to have to pick up the pace at some points. Lexi determined to finish that moment unfolding earlier this week in southern right. France. Woo! <laughs> we did it! <laughs> she says what kept her going was the support she got from young women all around the world. I get messages that have said that you know, seeing you know, a person that looks like them going out into the world and being brave and making the most out of every experience has inspired them to you know, take on other challenges and get out of their comfort zones in their own lives. And that's really at the end of the day what it's all about. Priya Shreether, NBC News. Wow, that is inspiring, but also sort of makes me feel ashamed of how much TV I watched as a teenager. Well, after weeks of recovery, two gray seal pups are back at home in the ocean. Earlier today, those pups were released along the New Jersey shore, not far from where they were rescued nearly two months ago. NBC News correspondent Emily Ikeda has more on their journey back to health. It's a big day for two gray seal pups in Brigantine, New Jersey, as they get ready to swim back into the wild. <laughs> Their journey along the Jersey Shore began in February when they were rescued by staff at the Marine Mammal Stranding Center. Number 11, as he's identified by staff, was found just miles away near the dunes in Brigantine Beach. We came across this little fluffy white gray seal. The seal's body still covered in his white birth coat. They usually keep it till they're weaned. So it's usually about two to three weeks. Just hours later, the center received an urgent call about another gray seal pup. She was reported to have something around her neck. From what we can tell, it's the plastic overwrap from a case of bottled water. Number 12 was only about a month old and was likely making her way down from northern New England and Canada, where many gray seals are born. As for that piece of plastic... She managed to get it off in the, in the crate on the transport back. She's very feisty. Once they arrived at the center, number 11 and 12 became the newest in-house patients, joining more than a dozen other SEALs on site. We treat this facility very much like you treat a human hospital. With no major medical issues, the rehab process for both pups was all about packing on the pounds and getting them to eat on their own, something that went swimmingly, especially for number 11. He likes to sing for his supper. Uh, he's very vocal about what, what he wants. Since arriving at MMSC, 11 and 12 have already doubled in size, now weighing about 80 pounds each, allowing them to graduate from their smaller pens to the big pool. Now, after nearly seven weeks of care with a tender touch, this adorable duo is ready to dive back in. We're hopeful that they'll head out and find their own way. It's just such a great feeling to watch them go. Emily Iketa, NBC News. Oh, I love that. What a great way to wrap it up tonight. I'm Stephen Romo. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.